Thank you, Laura, for your time, uh, for our value creation in life sciences series. Uh, we are very honored to have you. And uh, to start with, why don't we start with a small introduction of uh, you and Peptomic as well. Sure. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talking to you today. So my name is Laura Solchek, and I'm an ICREA research professor at the Valdebron Institute of Oncology where I also had the luck to um, be a co-founder and chief executive officer of a spin-off company called Peptomic. At Peptomic, we develop uh, new cancer therapeutics based on mini proteins. Uh, and uh, our lead compound is now in the second clinical trial. So we are advancing uh, slowly and surely. Uh, and it's a very exciting time for us. Excellent. Thank you very much. So in your web, I saw that, you know, you, you have written that uh, the cancer incidence is increasing. So just to understand uh, an overview, why do you think that, you know, cancer incidence is increasing? It is because of um, something, um, in environmental factors that has kind of changed uh, these days, or is it because something's happening inside our body that cancer incidence is increasing. Maybe for a layman, you can put put kind of a, a small description of why do you think cancer is increasing these days? Uh, there isn't just one single answer uh, to this question. Actually, it's a combination of, uh, of factors. Uh, um, first of all, uh, aging population. Uh, uh, we are very lucky because our lifespan is longer now than before and uh, Cancer is associated uh, with aging, uh, so we live longer, but we have more chance to develop uh, cancer during our lifetime. At the same time, it is sure that uh, our lifestyle uh, increases the chances to get cancer because of exposure to a lot of carcinogens uh, in our life. Our life is also made uh, of uh, uh, a lot of stress, uh, which yes. wasn't the case uh, several years ago. Uh, I struggle to find people that get bored during their day <laughs> at the moment. Also, we have access to a different type of food, uh, food that is uh, richer in fat. Uh, we tend to be much more static. We spend more and more hours sitting down and inside. Uh, than before. So there are several um, things that uh, we are not doing very well. So. Thank you. In fact, you know, if you, you know, if we had time, I could do a two hour interview with you uh, <laughs> only on diet and this one, because just to give you a kind of a sense that uh, uh, I, I myself reduced 18 kgs and I, uh, during COVID, I was increasing my weight and I studied a lot about diet and all that effect on cancer and how we are kind of eating and so on. It's a very favorite topic and one of our common friends and I, I keep, we keep talking, uh, talking a lot about uh, uh, the kind of foods that we are eating these days and so on. So thank you very much for this answer. I, I, I really appreciate that and, and I have uh, these answers from other uh, CEOs also from the oncology companies. Um, now let's go back to uh, let's say your role as an entrepreneur in, in Peptomic, you know that we are living in a very tough times, especially for biotech companies, right? Uh, of course we saw the boom, but uh, for the past two years, it has been a very tough period for almost all biotech companies. Uh, now, uh, when you raised money, uh, for example, for the past, let's say the life of Peptomic, can you tell us if you have to go back, would you try to reverse any decision that you think you made at the time you regret? Why? Because many times we learn from experience, right? And initially we do not have an experience as a first time CEO and so on. That question and um, it's usually that I wouldn't change anything because uh, even the mistakes taught me something. Uh, and actually, there is a lot to learn from mistakes, uh, and uh, luckily they were not mistakes that jeopardized in any way the development <laughs> of the company or of or its products. So that's important to distinguish big mistakes from mistakes that Correct. teach you something and are constructive mistakes at the end of the day. Um, yeah, that 
uh, the, the fundraising has been uh, continuous. So one thing that I would definitely recommend to any entrepreneur is never to relax. But once you have done a round of investment, uh, start preparing immediately for the next one uh, because you cannot count uh, on uh, a very strict, um, on a very clear timeline for your rounds of investment. Uh, uh, if you um, undergo um, this macroeconomic situation that we are living now, it's it's very difficult to have enough margin, uh, you know, for survival of a company while you struggle to fundraise. So it's very important never to relax after a, a round of uh, a fundraising. Start immediately another one. Don't don't count uh, on on uh, you know a, a long time. Uh, for, for the survival of the company. You cannot relax there. Absolutely. I think it's also pointed to, let's say the last video I put up, uh, you know, was that, you know, uh, as a biotech CEO, you need to have the sense of urgency. And I think, you know, you're talking about the same uh, thing, right? Having a sense of urgency all, all the time. Uh, to, to keep and you cannot for... predict everything that is gonna happen. Yeah. But exactly. told us that for sure. So exactly. really. We, we need to be prepared all the time, yes. So uh, so uh, let's say we, we talked about mistakes, but are there any decisions you made that you really are very proud of that, yes, you know, I, I made that right decision, you know, no matter it was a combination of several factors, could be luck, could be your skill, but nevertheless. Uh, well, probably need both, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, one thing that makes me proud is the choice of uh, the companions and uh, no, of the people that I chose to do this journey with. Uh, um, the team is extremely important, uh, but also, you know, the investors that you choose to have in your company. If you have the luxury to choose, <laughs> of choosing, definitely you have to choose the investors that uh, are really helpful and that... Uh, put their passion in your company and understand uh, the needs of the company and try to help but during uh, moments difficult moments uh, so it, it's it's really important to have uh, the right support so yes uh, if i have to be proud of something is uh, this type of team that i built around uh, myself that's excellent because i think you know uh, many people might uh, underestimate uh, this thing because Ultimately, biotech is all about the talent and talent of the people, you know, you have, you know, because so that brings me to a very interesting point. And I have just written that point here on my notebook because it's, it was harder for me to to kind of uh, remember this. So one of the fund managers long time ago said, we have to be willing to embrace unreasonable propositions and unreasonable people in order to make extraordinary findings because the notion that utterly utterly reasonable people doing utterly reasonable things will produce massive breakthrough doesn't compute to me so my question to you is <laughs> do you really believe in this because he is really making a point that and 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 it's true also if you look around the world the genius people are not easy to work with because uh, you know it's hard you know because you know they are they are something very different uh, so if you are if you're trying to do something breakthrough then sometimes you have to embrace unreasonable propositions and unreasonable people to make extraordinary findings because if you find nice people to work to have maybe you may not be able to do the breakthrough what do you think about that we absolutely agree <laughs> for the quite a lot of obstacles along the way because uh, our project was uh, not conventional. Uh, we are targeting an undruggable target that is called MIC, very difficult oncogene mm -hmm. in cancer that nobody thought was even uh, druggable. So yeah, that, that was something really difficult to start with. Then we adopted a strategy, a therapeutic strategy based on mini proteins. So mini proteins are not common therapeutics. Normally, people rely on antibodies or small molecules, and we don't fall in either category. We are trying to do something completely unconventional from that point of view. And then there is something important that you mentioned. You mentioned that uh, unconventional people, no? And I think that unconventional people 
are the ones that can think outside the box. Uh, they can really be trailblazers. Uh, the people that follow other paths uh, are more comfortable, um, but uh, they do exactly what somebody else has done. If you want trailblazers, uh, you cannot expect uh, them to follow the same path as other people, or even the same way of thinking uh, uh, of uh, other people. Uh, so it's true, it might be tricky to work with uh, such people, but uh, it can be also exciting. You know? um, I, I believe that when you build a team, uh, you really want to build it with very different skills and when it, people that might think differently from you also, because otherwise uh, you can just talk to the mirror and, <laughs> you know, you will always agree. Um, but uh, no, you want people to offer a different point of view from yours and uh, it might be conflictual in, uh, in some moments, but at the same time, uh, you can learn a lot from these other people. You can uh, see the same problem uh, from a different perspective and find a different solution from what you had planned uh, at the beginning. So no, it's it's absolutely an interesting journey there. Perfect. But don't worry, my next question won't be who are the unreasonable people who are working with you you are working with. No. So, <laughs> so um I said unconventional. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's go to the next question. Uh so what aspect of entrepreneurship you think is very difficult to teach to other people? So um, the, you cannot teach people to think outside the box, right? Uh, you can just show them a different perspective and a uh, different way to do things and see things. Uh, and uh, you hope that that type of attitude uh, gets transmitted and uh, welcome. Uh, so that's something that you can do, but you cannot teach uh, to think outside the box to start with. You can lead the way, but you cannot teach to do that. Uh, that's definitely something that I learned. Um, there are uh, other um, skills uh, that can be taught, uh, like the active listening. Um, again, you can learn from, from other people all the time. And you can learn how to accept criticism and uh, uh, restart uh, with a different attitude towards things after that. Um, in entrepreneurship, uh, you get used to being said no many times. When you go and fundraise, uh, many times uh, the answer is no uh, one thing that you can teach is that the no uh, more often means uh, not now but maybe tomorrow and uh, that's uh, that's something important it means that you will have another chance uh, just work towards addressing uh, the open questions that are out there and uh, use that no to 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 strengthen your position so that is something that you can teach, you know, to, to see the no as an opportunity uh, and not as a wall uh, that you cannot break. So that's definitely something that really helped me uh, along the way to, to take the no as a, um, as a chance to learn. Perfect. No, I, so when you, when you say that uh, it's very hard for people to teach to think out of the box. In fact, you cannot teach any people to think out of the box, which is very true. But what increases the chances of thinking out of the box? I mean, so what are the qualities or parameters or anything that person can do to think out of the box? One answer is, of course, the experience, you know, which as, as you have more experience, you, you have the pattern, right? But besides that, you know, what are the things you think, you know, people can do to think out of the box? One, one thing that, uh, you know, again, it's related to my personal experience was that uh, a lot of things uh, that I planned to do um, were considered uh, impossible or not doable. Uh, uh, at that time, when I was told that what I was doing was useless because it would not leave me anywhere. I My, my question was, uh, did anybody try? Please first try and then tell me whether it's possible or not. 
Um, I think uh, the famous scientific attitude uh, that uh, you have an hypothesis and you test it uh, sometimes uh, is forgotten. People mm. just think that things are impossible and don't test the hypothesis. In my case, I think that I just wanted to keep the scientific uh, mind and say, okay, I will do the, the test. If I fail, at least I yeah. will have the proof that that cannot be done. But I cannot accept that the thing cannot be done just because you tell me that it cannot be done. I really need to 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 see it. So, yeah, a Got little it. bit of skepticism on my side as well. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I completely agree with you. Um, so... Uh... Imagine, let's say, for example, uh, I, I know you know a lot of people are struggling to raise money right now, but let's say you get the required, you know, and, and as you know, biotech is capital intensive, and it's very hard many times for many entrepreneurs to tell that yes, I got the money I wanted. You know, uh, many times you try to reduce the amount of money you want to raise because of various factors and so on. But let's say, imagine you have the money sufficient amount of money to do what you want. What part of entrepreneurship you think is very difficult to scale uh, you know, in the company, for example? Well, the, the company never stops growing, you know, and so the needs of the company uh, grow with it, uh, and the team needs to be uh, built around those needs, uh, so um, skills, complementary skills need to take place, and that's, uh, that's one thing that needs to be taken into account immediately. There is no aspect in the company that grows on its own. It needs, it need, the company needs to be considered an organism. So all parts of the organism need to grow together. Otherwise, at some point, the company becomes unbalanced you know, in, in its different aspects. And that is something that uh, um, a scientist at the beginning uh, struggles with uh, in the sense that uh, we come from uh, a very pure scientific background. Uh, I didn't know anything about business. Uh, and so I tried to learn as quickly as possible to be a CEO of the company. I tried to learn about business uh, and finance uh, and all these other skills that I didn't have in my scientific background. But again, it's not something that a person does on uh, his or her own. It needs to, to be supported by a, a team that grows together uh, and uh, people that bring their own expertise. Talking about uh, other members of the company themselves or smart investors that provide uh, the, the type of feedback and experience that you're missing. So all these things need to be taken into account. A scientist needs to acquire quick skills quickly. And if those don't come uh, quick enough, those skills need to be complemented by other members on the team very, very quickly. Perfect. So um, my next question is mostly around um, how do you motivate uh, more people to become entrepreneurs than doing a classic job at Novartis, for example? It's a very good question. And uh, competing with... Uh, you know, with pharmas for the attraction of talents uh, is not easy. Uh, biotechs uh, uh, can lose their talents uh, because of, uh, of that type of competition. One thing that it's important is to motivate the members of your team, but uh, most of all, you need to give them the opportunity to grow. Um, I think that very often uh, the, the motivation comes with the opportunity to grow in a company mm -hmm. and so that is something that you need to offer and it's the only thing that we can compete with you know uh, compared to a big pharma very often the pharma needs a specific profile and that needs to fit the box and that profile cannot right. evolve within the pharma as biotech we can try to attract talents that then and then give them the opportunity to grow within the company and and evolve and grow Super. So in, in, in the last discussion, last question, you talked about how you try to learn business skills to become the CEO, right? So um, in your opinion, as you interact with several VCs and investors, how is creating a company as a co-creator, as a co-founder, for example, a different skill than being a VC who picks winners and or uh, who picks winners and tries to invest in, in that particular company? Um, 
what what is the what is the difference you know uh, how is creating that company as a co-founder very different than do you think that the vcs need to have some sort of experience as a ceo that might help to analyze the company better or you think that you know both are mutually exclusive no i think that there is no single path eh, for anybody <laughs> and i think that uh, um breakthrough ideas uh, are often uh, uh, built on really, really good science and breakthrough science. So having a, a founder of the company that is a scientist and developed that idea and uh, is is extremely valuable. That's what I think. And smart investors recognize that. Uh, then there are different stages in a company. So there's that same person that created the company and assumed the role as, as a CEO like me might decide at some point that that uh, position needs to be held by somebody with different skills, uh, uh, a deal maker, or somebody that uh, has the right network uh, uh, with investors or pharma to really develop the product to the market. Uh, right? So uh, the important thing is to be open-minded, uh, see the scientist uh, as uh, somebody that puts uh, all the passion uh, in the company, everything, the idea that is behind uh, the breakthrough uh, um, is uh, the scientist's idea. So let's leverage this, uh, this uh, strength that the good science and passion uh, have. And then uh, let's help these scientists to develop their <laughs> entrepreneurial skills. I think it's, it's very important. Not all scientists want to want to be CEO, and I understand that. But they can be involved in the company in the role, of the, like CSOs or in other roles. Definitely, they can help. Again, the complementarity of the different uh, profiles in the in the company will help that uh, development. Super. Now I'm going to ask you a very uh, interesting question. Maybe it might be considered. Uh little bit uh, sensitive, you know, in the sense, given that these days you know, anything can blow out of proportion, right? So I'm talking about, you know, because I read a lot about psychology of decision making, especially in men and women, right? So given that, you know, uh, as a women CEO, you are also surrounded by people, by men, you know, VCs, board and, and, and all that. What difference you see in the decision making process of men versus women? Do you see any tangible difference where you think that this is not about superiority, you know, this is about, right. you know, trying to make, you know, different decisions making. Never dream of claiming that uh, they work in the same way. I think that men <laughs> and women uh, uh, have a completely different process in decision making, uh, and uh, they might get to exactly the same uh, result or decision, but through different paths. We, we consider different things. Uh, um, it's... Uh, um, there is a lot of lateral thinking uh, that can happen. For example, uh, there are a lot of women that decide to lead the company with a completely different style, and that works. Uh, there is a lot of success be behind, you know, companies led by uh, women. So uh, that's definitely a proof that things can be done differently and with the same rate of success or even more in some cases. Um, so no, uh, I, yeah, as, as I said, I would never think that the process is the same, whether that has to do with considering, uh, different values. I don't, I don't really know, but there is a different, uh, thinking process so in uh, terms of, in, yeah. So in terms of, for example, taking risk, mm -hmm. do you think that women are more risk averse than men? Men try to take risky decision or make taking a bet. Uh, more than than women, for example? You know, uh, women tend to question themselves much more than men, I think, uh, and that prepares them for the risk. Uh, so they might just think about the risk more <laughs> and uh, have a lot of contingency plans uh, in place already. Uh, so it's not a, weak a weakness at all. The Being risk adverse means also simply to be Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, as I said, you know, this is not about, you know, superiority no, 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 exactly. or inferiority. Uh, so, I no, because I, I read a book called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, and she writes that, for example, if there is a job advertisement and when 
let's say when I look at it and I see that only 50% of the skill matches with that. So she says that men will apply for that, but women will be hesitant to apply. You know, <laughs> you, know you see the point? Yeah. So th that's why I wanted to understand that in the in your real world of decision-making process, have you, while making many other decision-making for value creation at Peptomic, uh, did you see that subtle difference where, you know, uh, you know, men try to take more risk, you know, and that taking more risk doesn't mean more return, you know, people oh, confuse exactly. this, you know, more risk means that, you know, you could have a probability of high return, but you could also have a probability of very low return, actually, you know, so uh, it's, it's, it works both ways. I definitely saw it. I definitely saw that. Uh, and usually when a woman comes with a project, uh, she has uh, thought about that project for so long <laughs> and rehearsed it. Uh, in her head so many times that you probably are going to get an excellent project in place. Yes. Absolutely. So I assume, you know, you're trying to work towards, you know, uh, telling your female uh, founders and so on to take more risk as possible, right? You know, so. Absolutely. They deserve it when they come up with the idea, that idea has been uh, really thought through. One thing that I want to stress, though, is that, for example, in our company, there is no gender uh, bias at all. Uh, the only selection criterion <clears throat> is excellence. So, so uh, I think that's the only guidance that we should uh, follow. Uh, excellence is the, the common thing. Super. So uh, my last and, and uh, final question, uh, as we run out of time, is... is uh, any learnings, uh, you know, you got it as an entrepreneur in the seven to eight year that fascinated you all of a sudden and you want to share with the people. You know, like for example, there is one point which I learned and I share with all the CEOs, you know, with whom I work, that to be successful, you have to survive first. This is a very simple and such an important point, but many people don't realize it. So, you know, this was a learning, I learned it and it fascinated me so much that I shared with many people. Do you have any such thing, you know, that you learned and you think, oh, wow, you know, this is such a great thing and I should share it with many people? I, I'm just sorry for repeating myself, but uh, that uh, consideration that I made regarding uh, how to take a no is really what helped me. Um, a no is uh, most of the times not now. And so uh, that no is definitely not a closed door. It's uh, a door ajar, and uh, you, you should knock at it again when you're ready and stronger. So. Super. Thank you very much, Laura, for uh, uh, coming here and sharing your invaluable experience. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.